This week, we'll be exploring mysteries that range from the strange fireballs shooting out of this river in Thailand every single year, to this mysterious ghost ship that radioed for help, and when they eventually found and boarded this ship, its entire crew had died in mysterious conditions, and nobody knew why. We will explore all of these and more, so grab a drink. My choice today, if I don't spill it, is chai. And join me as we explore the Unsolved Mysteries iceberg. Dang it, I did actually spill it. And starting off this week, we have Yubia de Peces, which I sound like the least Spanish, Spanish person in the world. But this translated means rain of fish. And it was this phenomenon that occurred every year for hundreds of years in Yoro, Honduras. It seemed to happen multiple times a year. And during this phenomenon, there would be like massive heavy rainfall. And then in the next few days, people would find fish just all over the ground. And so it became known as the rain of fish. Now where these fish exactly came from wasn't too clear. There were some theories that say that these fish were picked up by something called a water spout, which is like this mini typhoon sort of thing. And this carried it over and then dropped it down where they found the fish. But one of the problems with this theory is that the nearest sea source is like 45 miles away. So for a spout to pick up fish and then carry them 45 miles inland, that is a bit of a stretch. So people People thought that these might be perhaps freshwater fish, you know, from nearby rivers or lakes. But how exactly they got from these rivers and lakes to, you know, on land, people weren't entirely sure of either. And one theory, which I think I like this theory the best, was that after this massive rainfall, a bunch of the rivers and lakes and stuff actually flooded. The water levels rose up, they came, you know, onto the surface, onto the land, and with them came the fish. And then after the rain stopped, the waters receded back into the river, and the fish were left stranded on the ground. Now, we don't know that that's exactly what has happened, or that does happen happen every single year, but that is always a theory. A pretty good one, I think. There's also the religious theory that says that a priest way back in the day saw how like poor and hungry the people of Honduras were, and so he prayed for God to, you know, bless them with food, and since that day, God has been, you know, sending down fish via this rain in order to feed the people of Honduras. So yeah, a few theories for this one, but officially the cause of this rain of fish is, as of today, technically unknown. Logan Schindelman was this 19 year old kid guy who went missing in Washington in May 2016. Now, Logan was up until recently at this point, quite a good kid. He had a history of doing quite well in athletics. His test results seemed to be fairly decent for the last few years, but it was only really quite recently he started to get a bit distracted. His grades started to drop. He started, you know, smoking a bit of the wacky tobacco every now and then. And partly this was caused by his like identity crisis, I guess. He was mixed race. He had an Arab father. He had a mother who herself was half black, half white. So he was like quarter black, quarter white, half Arabic. And he had obviously white grandparents that he stayed with and he grew up in a white neighborhood. So he felt like, you know, his African family didn't really know him or want him. He was darker skinned, so he didn't fit in in this white neighborhood or with his white grandparents. Parents. His Arab father had basically left him, so he wasn't tied with that part of his ancestry. So yeah, it was known that he was kind of confused, kind of didn't really know where he fit in. This crisis affected his grades, and that's kind of the lead up for this case. Now on this particular morning, Logan was at his home. So, you know, at his grandmother's home, essentially. And before she went to work in the morning, she had like a little chat with him. He seemed a little off. She said he seemed a little like nervous, on edge, like he was focused on something else, sort of thing. But she didn't want to pry too much. And so she said, look, we'll talk about this. We'll discuss it when I come back from work. And she then went off to work. But that evening she got home. Logan wasn't there. She tried to contact Logan and he didn't pick up. So then she tracked his phone and found that his phone was around the Olympia area, which is kind of the area where his mother lived. And he did visit his mother quite regularly. So the grandma just assumed, okay, he's gone to visit his mom. Not a big deal sort of thing. And she went to sleep sleep, woke up the next morning, still hadn't heard from Logan. And so she inquired with the mum, you know, have you seen Logan? Have you spoken to him? I thought he was visiting you yesterday sort of thing. And she hadn't seen or heard from him either. So they put in a missing persons report with the police, except they only tried to because the police station was actually closed for the weekend. Like what the hell, what sort of police station closes for the weekend? So they left it until Monday. They finally put through a missing persons report and the police informed the grandmother that Logan Logan's co 
car had actually been impounded the day after he went missing and that she could go down and collect it from the impound lot. So already this was very, very strange. She went down there, she got the car, inside the car was Logan's keys, Logan's wallet, his ID and his phone, as well as a few like bits of food, drinks sort of thing, but Logan was still nowhere to be found. Now they sought some help from the public on this, you know, had anyone seen him, had anyone seen his car before this, you know, before it was impounded, and it turns out that people had seen his car around the same area that it was found and, you know, taken away. But on the morning of the 20th, so like a few days ago, someone said they saw Logan's car pulled up onto the side of the highway and they saw Logan standing at the back of the car with these two unidentified white males. And then later on in the evening, as this person was, you know, making their way back the same route, they saw the car still there, but no sign of anyone else, no sign of Logan. So very strange. And when the car was found and, you know, impounded, people say that what happened was the car was parked up on the side of the road and then all of a sudden it just veered off into traffic you know through the three lanes and then smashed into the central barrier and when this happened a white male climbed out of the passenger seat passenger seat that's harder to say than it looks or sounds but a white male came out and just immediately ran into the woods and was never found so we don't know who this particular white male was we don't know who the white males were that he was standing with on the side of the road and at this point logan was just completely missing so people have kind of linked these events all together and try to make some sense, some story about what actually happened. And the most popular one is that Logan met up with these two boys or two men. Perhaps he was into some underhanded stuff, perhaps some stuff to do with the wacky tobacco. Maybe he was looking to buy, maybe he was looking to sell. And yeah, he met up with these two people. Either the deal went wrong or something happened to Logan. He had to be disposed of. And while one of the males was disposing of him in some way, then as to not raise suspicion, the other the male stayed in Logan's car and it is thought that perhaps he was in the driver's seat. Then he kind of climbed over into the passenger seat and in climbing over he knocked the gear stick from like park into neutral and this made the car you know start rolling maybe it was on a slope and it rolled through the traffic into the central barrier and yeah just crashed into it. Then this male got out fled the scene and that is the general idea for possibly what happened. Police did a massive search of the nearby woods, of the nearby area, they searched cameras, they searched traffic cameras, but Logan was never found. These two men were never found or identified. They even had like cadaver dogs, sniffer dog sort of thing. They didn't really turn anything up. And that is sadly where this case ended. Nobody has seen Logan since that day and where he is or what happened to him is just a complete mystery. The Mariana Trench bone pit. So this is something that I could barely find evidence on. And I think partly the reason for that is it seems to be just a theory as opposed to like a factual entry with actual evidence on. But the idea here is that in the Mariana Trench, so the deepest, darkest point of the ocean that we know of, all the way down there, there is this giant bone pit filled with the bones of all sorts of creatures, fish, whales, maybe humans, snake bones. And some of the theories say that this is because a giant creature lives down there and he roams around feeding on creatures down there. And then sometimes he comes up to the surface and, you know, we spot him or her and then it eats something comes back down, deposits the bones, and just keeps doing that all around. Or some say this is the work of aliens, in that anything they do kill, they don't want to dispose of in an area that we can find it. You know, which is like, why don't they just disintegrate it? Doesn't make much sense to me. Or that this is a bone pit used by some ancient civilization, some underwater civilization sort of thing, and they use it maybe as a graveyard or as a depository or something. As I said, very little evidence for this, very flimsy kind of fanciful theories. So I'd say don't take it too deeply, pun absolutely intended. And yeah, just a little interesting thing to think about. Malamo is this cool but scary critter little fellow sort of thing that comes from everyone's favorite place, and that is lumberjack folklore. Now, honestly, some of the best creatures come from these folklore, and this one is no different. But this creature was frequently seen across North America in like the 18 and 1900s, and it was a crane that was so large that it would eat these giant worms and I guess it was one of the only birds capable of eating these giant worms and yeah that's it 
It hasn't been seen in a long, long time, but that's basically as far as the entry goes. Giant birds. The Millennium Prize problems. So these are these seven super, super complex math problems that each actually have a million dollar reward for anyone who solves them. These are the Birch Swinerton Dyer Conjecture, which catchy name, I know, the Hodge Conjecture, the Navier Stokes Existence and Smoothness, the P versus NP problem, which we actually covered higher up in the iceberg, pretty cool, I know, the Ryman Hypothesis, the Yang Mills Existence and Mass Gap, and the Poincaré Conjecture, or is it the Poincaré Conjecture? I don't know, I'm not French. They're all mathy, they're all complex, they're all unsolved, and they're all pretty central and important to, you know, mathematics in general, to mathematical breakthroughs, and yeah, a million dollar prize for anyone who solves one of them, which honestly is probably chump change. Like some of these, if you were able to solve them, a lot of them would change industries as we know it. And if you have the solution for some of these and you're able to, you know, market it, sell it to a company perhaps, then I would assume you probably make billions of dollars rather than a million. But that's a whole nother ethical discussion we can have. And actually one of them, the Poincaré, or however you pronounce it, conjecture, was actually solved in 2002 by a man named Grigory Perelman, and he actually refused to accept the prize money, which is pretty noble of him. Maybe a little bit foolish. I mean, you could always take the prize money and give it away to charity, but regardless, the other six problems have yet to be solved, and I won't get into them in this video because they are extremely mathy, extremely complex, and this video would be like five hours long, and it would be released in about five or six years after I had gotten a maths degree, so for sake of simplicity, I won't go into them, but feel free to explore them in your own time. The Moreland UFO claims. So this is always nice. A UFO slash alien entry just after I've put out my, you know, biggest iceberg ever on aliens and UFOs. But we didn't cover this one in the iceberg, so it is a little refreshing. But this covers the case of Eileen Moreland, who was a 42-year-old farming woman who got up early one morning like normal to milk her cows in Blenheim, New Zealand. Now, as I said, she woke up up quite early, went across the field, and went to milk her milk cows, or dairy cows I guess they're called, and all of a sudden, when she was in the field, she saw in the sky these crazy bright green lights. She thought it was a bit strange, so she went behind a tree, you know, hid for cover sort of thing, and then the lights got more immense. She saw this circular craft sort of thing come out of the sky, and then it got closer and closer. It went into the field, and out of this craft came these two humanoid creatures, and they shouted at her, said something in this foreign language which she couldn't understand, probably alienese or something, and then they went back into their craft, the doors closed up, and it took off back into the sky wherever it came from before Eileen could even say, holy cow. She was just completely shocked at this encounter, a little bit confused, but she thought, while I'm out here, I may as well continue milking the cows. So she did that, then she went back home, she told her husband what happened, and at first he didn't believe her, he accused her of being drunk, but then eventually she did convince him, he said you should probably, you know, notify someone of this, call the police, and so she made a police report. Now the police came round, they seemingly took this quite serious, you know, they sat her down, they interviewed her, and as with a bunch of these, they said that she was pretty straightforward. Her story seemed to be quite solid. She didn't seem the type to be, you know, making things up or fantasizing or didn't seem the type to be crazy or delusional. Like what she said happened seemed to be from the police's perspective what actually happened. Like she was a reliable witness. And they also found another witness that same morning who saw a bright light in the sky around the time that Eileen saw this light. So they thought, that's a little strange. And after doing some more investigating, they just seemingly found more and more and more witnesses of this occurrence. A strange bright light in the sky. Sometimes it was white or clear. Sometimes it was green. And there are some theories that say that this was the planet Venus. Like apparently it was quite bright around this time. And if Venus appears low to the horizon, then possibly as it's right on the horizon, you can maybe sometimes see green flashes like the green sun flash that we covered 
earlier up in the iceberg. So that was one theory about maybe what might have happened. Another theory was that Eileen was, you know, crazy or delusional or making this up. But that theory to me doesn't really make much sense because you have so many other people witnessing this at the same time. Or, of course, the other theory is that there actually was something in the sky, be it a government tech or craft, be it an alien craft, and this is what, you know, everyone saw. So you'd think that's kind of where the case ends, except this kind of bizarre thing happened where after Eileen came out about this, apparently people started to treat her like, you know, she was foolish or she was crazy or just doing it for attention. So she got kind of negative backlash from the people who knew her, from the public, and she had actually seen another sighting after this, but said when she went to report it that I'm only reporting this if you can promise me that the word won't get out about this at all. Like, I don't want attention, I don't want this getting out, I don't want any publicity about it, and so she made the New Zealand government swear to basically keep it a secret, and they essentially did. They also kept the original sighting a secret, partly, you know, for their own benefit, partly to, you know, respect Eileen's privacy. And so this information didn't come out for the next 50 years. Like whenever people inquired about it, they saw newspapers about it. And then they went, oh, that happened back then. That's kind of crazy. They went to the government to ask for any files or any documents about this occurrence. And the government basically said, what occurrence? They said, we've searched through all of our files. We have no evidence that anything happened on that date around that area, which seemed to contradict the newspaper reports and all of that sort of thing. And that was because the government was genuinely covering this event up, but some people thought it was because there were genuine aliens there, and others thought they were covering it up to, you know, honor Eileen, keep her story and all that a secret, so she wasn't harassed further. So yeah, and that just fueled more and more conspiracy theories, and it really wasn't good. But as I said, they kept it a secret for this long and then eventually did come out with it, spill the beans. They also, during this time, as they had done in America, or, you know, as the Americans had done, New Zealand also kind of followed along and they discouraged their pilots from reporting anything they saw in the sky. They discouraged the public from reporting these sorts of things as they basically just thought it was wasting their time. So yeah, kind of a cool alien sighting and story, kind of a cool proven cover-up afterwards. And whether you think Think this was an actual genuine alien cover-up or whether you think it was just to protect Eileen's identity that is for you to decide. Morgulons is this very strange somewhat gross skin condition where it's often self-diagnosed by the people who have it and the people say that there are these sores like all over their skin under their skin that have inside them like fibrous material whether that's like cloth or cotton or fibers and these are thought to be mostly in the person's head or you know a physical symptom of a mental condition like it's made worse by anxiety and then scratching and irritation sort of thing but when the patients go in for a checkup when the doctors inspect this apparent skin condition they never do find anything the tests all come back you know negative for these so i guess the whole mystery behind this is whether it is genuinely a skin condition whether it's being covered up for some reason by the government or at least diminished what the origin or cause of this skin condition is or whether it is just genuinely a mental condition whether it's in the person's head you know a delusional anxiety based sort of thing and yeah a very strange one i think i prefer like alien and cryptid mysteries myself, but it is what it is. Mysterious Blue Dot. So this is this Screamer video that was put out onto YouTube in 2012. Now on the video there was this mysterious blue circle and the camera kind of like zooms in, zooms out, it's a little mysterious. Maybe you follow along with it, you look in, you look out, and then BAM! Scary man with no eyes jumps out and scares you. Yeah, very scary. This was originally a piece of lost media, but it is now only a partially lost media, as while they have recovered the video side of it, we still don't have the audio side. So it's likely this was, you know, a test or a psychological sort of video, being like, oh, if you close your eyes and then zoom into the blue dot and then open your eyes and then do, you know, to get people to focus on the video, focus on this blue circle and then obviously the super loud audio scream came in but yeah so without the audio we don't get to experience the full scare and honestly that might just be for the best. The Naga Fireball. So this is this pretty cool phenomenon that happens every single year along the Mekong River or Mekong River or maybe some other pronunciation in Thailand. And these little fireballs, as you can see, they come out of the river, they come from the river, fly up into the air and then 
disappear. And we have no idea why. Legends say that they are caused by a naga or snake that's, you know, in the river and maybe shoots up fireballs every year into the sky. And some theories say that this is a type of swamp gas or something that's trapped in the river. And somehow when it comes up, it like ignites as soon as it hits the air. And then this rises and then, you know, dissipates. So a few theories, none have been proven or are super definitive just yet. And so still to this day, we don't know what causes this pretty interesting, pretty cool looking phenomenon. Oliver Lurch. So for this entry, we need to go back all the way to 1890, Indiana. And this is where a 20 year old Oliver Lurch was at a Christmas party on his farm. And he went outside to fetch some water from his well. And and then after a few minutes, the people inside the house, they heard Oliver screaming and he was screaming either it's got me or they've got me. This is not really clear, but he was screaming something like that. The people rushed out to try and find him and they found his footsteps in the snow up about halfway to the well and then two buckets there and then no footprints absolutely anywhere. When they came out there, they could apparently still hear Oliver screaming up in the air. They obviously looked up. They couldn't see anything. They searched the entire farm, the entire house, they searched the wells, but Oliver was never found and he was never seen again. Now, I'll be honest with you, upon further inspection of this story, it does seem like it was just a story, perhaps. Like, it was posted in a few newspapers and a few articles as a genuine event that happened, but when you trace it back and back, it has been kind of linked to a story that was made up and changed over the years. So, I mean, perhaps it was made up, perhaps it actually happened, perhaps Oliver was sucked up by a UFO or taken away by a creature or picked up by an extra large pigeon or something, or perhaps it was just an interesting story. I will leave that for you to decide. The Orleans Parish Jane Doe. Was this lady found dead under a house in New Orleans in 1998? She had a broken shoulder, some pretty standard clothes on, gray pants, a red shirt, shoes, and that's about it for this case. There's not much else in the way of clues or details or obviously identity because she was a Jane Doe, but I do hope this lady, whoever she was, is now in a better place. But once again, just look how many Jane Doe's there actually are. You know, this is just for New Orleans alone. There are like dozens of them for seemingly every county, every city, every state. Like seriously, it is a little worrying and upsetting to think about all these women who have gone missing or rather who have been found but can't be identified. But hopefully we do get better at identifying them over the years. Oorang Medan was this name of this alleged ship that was found floating aimlessly around the waters around Indonesia. So this was in the 1940s and nearby vessels had heard this like distress call and it was received in Morse code. And the Morse code read SOS from Oorang Medan. We float. All officers, including the captain, dead in chart room and on the bridge. Probably whole of crew dead. And then finally, after a brief pause, the words, I die. And then radio silence. A nearby ship, the Silver Star, went out to look for this ship. They eventually did find the Orang Medan floating just aimlessly in the waters. And so the crew of the Silver Star pulled up alongside. They boarded this ship and they apparently just found bodies like everywhere. The entire crew was dead, just like it said in the Morse code. And there was strangely no weapons found anywhere, no blood, no injuries, like no attack had taken place. So what exactly caused all of these deaths was a little unclear. So anyway, the Silver Star crew members got back onto their ship. They went to tow this ship back to shore to do a further investigation. And all of a sudden, as they were going to tow it, the ship caught fire and then exploded and sank down to the bottom of the ocean. Now, there are a few different versions of this story or this event across like multiple newspapers, multiple articles sort of thing. And some people think that this means the story isn't true, but I tend to think just stories change over the years. Like even if you have an actual event that did happen, if it's not too popular, it's not too common, each telling of the story will change a little bit of the story anyway. And so you might have multiple different versions of an actual real event. But one of these articles told of an Italian missionary that was on a nearby island and he found a crew member of this ship and he was like you know on death's door he was in a bad way but he said what had happened is they were illegally smuggling this 
chemical basically from a Chinese dock, the chemical being sulfuric acid, and apparently they didn't seal up the containers quite well enough. The gas from the sulfuric acid leaked out, everyone on the ship, you know, breathed it in, and they all died. And this would have been also what caught fire and what exploded and sunk the ship. He said he was the only remaining survivor, he was able to, you know, get off the boat, get to an island, but that he had also breathed in quite a bit, and so he was dying. And soon after giving this testimony to the Italian missionary, he did also die shortly after. There weren't any official records of this ship in any of like the docks or the charters sort of thing, but then again that is something you would expect from a, you know, illegal delivery. They would be undercover, they would maybe have a fake name or no name at all, they would go to random docks to receive these shipments. So I don't think that's out of the ordinary at all, but it is a very eerie entry, a very creepy one, you know, all the people died, they all all had this look of fear and horror in their faces when the bodies were found apparently, but we still don't know if this is entirely true, partly true, entirely made up, or many more details about this entry. Paul Deering was this man, who checked into a hotel on October 21st, 1993. Everything seemed to be normal, he checked into the hotel, he gave his name, he gave his address, and he took the keys, went to his room, and that was basically it. Until three days later when the staff noticed that Paul hadn't checked out of his room. So they obviously went over there, knocked on the door, there was no response. They opened the door to check and they found Paul lying on his bed dead completely dead. Now, they called the police, obviously, there was an investigation started, and they found a lethal amount of cyanide in his system, so it seemed like he perhaps did this to himself, but it also could have been maybe some sort of murder. And so, obviously, they had his name, Paul Deering, they had his address. The next thing to do was notify his next of kin, his family, about what happened to him. And since he had a wedding ring on, they assumed that he was married, or at least divorced, and so they looked up his address and found that there was just a Paul Deering registered as living there, so that wasn't much help. But upon further inspection, the Paul Deering registered to this address was actually still living at that address. That is to say, this Paul Deering who died in the hotel wasn't actually Paul Deering. We don't know who he was, he didn't have any identification on him, and this actual Paul Deering was actually alive, he was actually living in the address that this fake guy had given, and he said he didn't know this guy in the hotel, he didn't recognize him. So it seems a bit strange, it's like he got the name and address of this random guy and gave it as his own, he didn't seem to know the guy, and he didn't have any further identification on him, so they never Never found out where he was from, who he was, whether he had family or a wife or kids or anything like that, and they weren't able to contact anyone regarding his death. So, a very sad and tragic story. I don't know what was going on in the life and the mind of this, you know, fake Paul Deering, but I hope he's in a better place now. The Pendleton Quadruple Murders. So these took place in 2015 South Carolina, and it involves the brutal murders of Michael Scott, his wife Kathy Scott, and their two elders elderly mothers. All four of them lived in the same house, and when Kathy's daughter hadn't seen her mother in like, you know, a while, she decided to go and check up on her. She went into the house, noticed the back door was actually left unlocked, which was very unusual for this family, and inside she found all four of these people dead on the floor, having been shot, and not much else. She obviously immediately called the police, they started an investigation, they couldn't really find any motive for these killings, there didn't really seem to be a robbery that had taken place, nothing substantial was missing from the house, and Michael and Kathy were honestly some of the nicest people you might ever meet. They were super kind, they were supportive, they were very family oriented, you know, as was apparent with living with their own mothers to take care of them. They helped out family members in need, siblings, daughters, sons, grandchildren, like they were super cool, super nice people, and for some reason they were all brutally murdered in their own home. There wasn't any sign of a forced entry or anything like that, and since as the, you know, extended family said that Michael and Kathy never left windows open, they never left doors open or unlocked when they weren't, you know, secured, that whoever committed these crimes must have either been invited into the house, in that they knew the family or they were friendly with them, or they somehow snuck in or like threatened their way in, 
10 or something like that. But they were looking for people who knew or were friendly with the family. And although they did do a bit of investigating down that, you know, avenue sort of thing, they never did find any real suspects, any real leads. They never arrested or convicted anyone for these crimes. And these murders to this day do remain unsolved. The Penkalin Chepa creature. Ah, ah, scary, 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 scary. This creature was spotted in 2016 around a boarding school in Malaysia and it was thought by the local population and by the school members to be perhaps a djinn of sorts and it appeared multiple times there was multiple sightings of this creature and it seemed to appear after the students were you know littering around the forest around the school sort of thing so the general idea was that this was a you know demon or jinn or spirit looking to teach the kids a lesson to punish them and pretty much everyone in the entire school had some experience with this creature whether it was directly seeing the creature or experiencing students being possessed by the creature or just strange you know phenomenon they felt a cold breeze or they felt the spirit around the halls or something and because of this the school was actually cancelled for a few days and they brought in investigators they brought in police they even brought in religious people and witch doctors to you know exercise this spirit and whether they succeeded or not i really couldn't tell you but what the cause for this was or what the creature actually was jinn demon spirit alien ghost we don't really know. Philip Inns Fraser. So this was a 25 year old man who went missing in British Columbia, Canada in 1988. He was living in Alaska and he basically had to travel to his college that he was attending and this was in Washington state. So to get from Alaska down to Washington you needed to have driven through Canada and he made the drive down, he went through the border customs and he actually had two of his guns confiscated because they said you weren't allowed to bring guns into Canada which is like like, ugh, fine, fair enough, I guess. And he continued driving down towards Washington when eventually he stopped at a cafe, a side road for gas. And it was there that this guy who was acting a bit strange, the people around said, it was here that he came up to Philip and basically asked him if he could get a ride to somewhere. And Philip said like, no, thank you. He filled up his gas. He went to drive away. And this guy was apparently chasing Philip down. Like he was running after his car. And this personally would make me, you know, accelerate even faster but i guess philip perhaps felt sorry for the guy so he slowed down he stopped he said okay fine i'll drop you off you know wherever you're going and this was the last time that philip was ever seen alive fast forward a few hours like eight hours to be specific and 200 miles away this driver who's driving along the road he notices this hitchhiker by the side of the road and he stops this driver the driver has a chat with him and this hitchhiker who has a car here says would you mind helping me out i'm having some car troubles i'm kind of stuck and stranded here and this driver did think this guy on the side of the road was a bit weird he seemed a bit nervous or something but he did agree to tow his car into town and this was a couple who picked them up Eddie and Pauline Olsen and they actually took this guy they towed his car with him in it all the way back to their home and actually let this guy sleep in their house in their basement and yeah I think they dodged a bullet on this one he went to sleep there he woke up the next morning they were you know chatting away over breakfast and he said that his name was Philip Fraser and that he lived in Alaska and he was traveling down to Washington to go to college and he wanted to sell his car and buy a plane ticket which first of all it's very strange to sell your car just to buy a plane ticket to the same place and secondly this guy was basically taking Philip's entire identity so super creepy the couple was naturally suspicious of this guy like they noticed he was acting a bit strange a bit creepy they noticed he had two wallets for some reason obviously one of these was his one of them was Philip's but they didn't know this at the time they just thought he was a bit off so this guy eventually went outside he fixed his car or Philip's car and then he drove away and he was never seen again. Philip's car was later found abandoned like 300 miles away from where the couple lived and it had been set on fire completely burnt and that was seemingly to you know get rid of any evidence and Philip's body later did turn up two months after this and it was found having been shot in the head and buried in a shallow grave as I said this hitchhiker this murdering creep was never seen again he was never found or identified and we don't really know what became of him police think he likely at least for a little while afterwards used Philip's identity because on Philip's person and in the destroyed car they couldn't find Philip's identification his bank cards his driving license 
license, passport, documents, anything like that. So they think that this creepy hitchhiker guy took all of it, took Philip's identity and used it at least for a little while. But yeah, as I said, we don't really know what became of the guy. There are some theories to say that he was a serial killer named Michael Wayne McGray, who operated kind of in the same area, kind of at the same time. And he was convicted of killing seven people. And he also said he killed an additional 11 people that he was never convicted for. But he never did admit to doing this crime or to killing Philip or anything like this. So it's like if you're admitting to crimes that you haven't even been charged with, why wouldn't you admit to this crime if you actually did do it? And I guess he does look somewhat similar to the sketches of this hitchhiker. This theory is not entirely solid, I wouldn't say, but it is still a possibility. Rest in peace, Philip, and I hope you are in a better place. Physics defying Antarctic particles. So once again, we have another sciency, another spacey entry, and this one is quite short, so I won't spend too long on it. I won't bore you with the complex nature of it, but basically, all out there, there are these tiny particles called neutrinos. And these neutrinos are so, so tiny, and a lot of them originate from the sun, but they shoot out from the sun, and a lot of them travel through our Earth without colliding with any matter inside the Earth, which is kind of insane to think about. But if you imagine something like my hand, well, you don't need to imagine it, it's right here. But as you can see from your perspective, it looks quite solid. Now, if we zoom in further in, further in, further into my hand, and you get down into like the molecular level, you will eventually find stuff like atoms. And between the atoms, there's, you know, a bit of space. And then you zoom further and further and further into the atoms and you'll find tiny particles spinning around. And obviously between these particles, there is space. And then you zoom even, even, even further in. And between whatever is smaller than that, you will find space in between them. So what you basically find is that most of what is matter is actually empty space or like energy. So you can imagine it's something like our solar system, where within our solar system, you have the absolute majority of it being just empty space. And then occasionally you will have these little, you know, planets flying around, maybe tiny moons, but they are so far spread out that held together with gravity. And that's basically what matter is like on the molecular level. It's just incredibly far apart, tons of space in between it. And so these neutrinos, which are so, so tiny, they basically just slip and slide between all those giant gaps in matter and a lot of them do actually end up flying through the entire earth and i hope that all makes sense i hope this analogy makes sense i know i'm not often the best at explaining these sorts of things but what scientists have recently found is they have detected on the south pole in like antarctica they have detected coming from the earth these super high powered neutrinos which obviously they're not coming from the earth they're traveling through the earth and coming out the other end of it and that's where we detect them but this wouldn't be unusual at all if they were just regular neutrinos, because regular neutrinos do, as I said, often travel through the Earth. But these super high powered, super high energetic neutrinos aren't like regular neutrinos, and they quite often do smash into things and are blocked by things. So for one of these super high powered neutrinos to actually travel through the Earth, it's like almost an impossibility. And yet, it happens. We don't know why, we don't know how, but we have made multiple detections of these super high powered neutrinos detected coming out of the earth into the South Pole. And we figure they come from outer space somewhere. They are powered up by something in space. There's that side of the mystery as well. Like we don't know exactly where these come from, but there's also the mystery of how in the heck are they traveling through the earth? All a big mystery, still haven't figured it out yet. But as always, super, super interesting. All of this space stuff, all of this sciency stuff. And yeah, as I said, still a big mystery. And that is all we have time for. Bit of a shorter week this one, but it is what it is. I hope you are all getting enough sunlight. I hope you're all drinking enough water. And I hope you are all loving yourself more than you think you deserve. I hope you all enjoyed this week's video. I will see you all in a few days. And as always, thanks for watching.